Are you all set? Yeah. Here we go. <laughs> Let me introduce myself. Um, I am Master William Shakespeare. Okay, so you'll help me, yes? Yes. Okay, brilliant. Yes, my Joe's pancreas, that is fantastic. For the first time in months, I am officially in the Shakespeare Goes Viral is a podcast inspired by Will and Co's project Bard in the Yard. Learn more about Shakespeare's life, writings, and key themes that inspired him. Listen to writer and director Victoria Gartner tell you a story like no other. say about the amazing project that is Bard in the Yard. Um, I have so many amazing uh, memories of those two summers I spent wandering <laughs> to different different venues to find different audiences to share the stories. Um, but I suppose one particular moment sits out in my mind. Um, it was um, during the first summer of lockdown and in the first version of Bard in the Yard, King Leonardo and his three daughters um, and his dog, of course. And I had a, a, a quite an interesting booking. It was from a, a woman who, a single woman, who was coming to Stratford um, for her holiday and she usually goes to the RSC to see something. And of course it was closed. So she found um, Victoria and she found um, the company, Will & Co, and she booked her Bard. And um, it was just for her and her friend who were visiting Stratford. Um, and I was a bit nervous about doing it to such a small audience. Um, and uh, But I shouldn't have worried about that because um, the audience grew and grew as the piece grew. And it was quite an amazing, <laughs> amazing thing. Um, first of all, the, the, the space was um, in, in a little courtyard garden next to a canal path. So already you have traffic, you have boats, you have people walking along the canal, you have neighbours. Um, so uh, a piece that began with uh, an audience of two ended up being an audience of, of plenty, of tens, of twenties of people who were just involved in the show. Um, the first person to make an appearance was uh, the neighbour who popped her head over the, um, the fence just at the time where I was um, Romeo calling to Juliet on the balcony and she would obviously became my Juliet and then stayed for the rest of the performance. I had a whole gang of men on a, on a I think maybe on a stag do going along the um, the canal um, in, on their boat and they became the rabble of, of, of Shakespeare's um, London uh, whilst talking about what the audience was like in the, in the globe at the time um, and then I had a little boy dress up as a pirate um, and with his sword and I was at that point I was doing a bit of Macbeth and uh, and actually a bit of stage fighting there's a little stage fighting section in it so uh, there he was on the other side of the canal fighting alongside me um, and then of course that's nature that got involved as well um, at the end of uh, the, the beautiful um, piece uh, of poetry by uh, the fairy um, in uh, in a midsummer night dream over hill over dale through a bush through a briar over a park over pale through a flood through a fire I do wonder everywhere swifter than the moon's sphere at the end of that whole paragraph the whole piece a flock of birds flew from the canal out into the air, uh, geese, and with this amazing, huge sound that their their wings made. And it was like the most perfect ending <laughs> to that piece. It was pure magic. So um, I think that is my favourite moment for all the reasons that I've just stated. It was, in many ways, a piece of pure theatre involving the most incredible coincidences and the most glorious audiences, both human and animal. And I'll always remember it for the rest of my life. Oh! We should have a ghost in the play! That's a great idea! Write that down. Go on, write that down, all of you. Write it down. Yeah, brilliant. We should have a ghost in the play. <gasps> and witches! Yeah. Oh! Yeah. Like, don't get me started about witches. <laughs> Episode 5, Shakespeare and Magic. Shakespeare and Magic is big and is intense and is a subject I always usually shy away from because I love it so much. You know when sometimes when you love something, you don't want to look at it too closely because you're afraid you're gonna break the magic? First of all, I think in terms of context, the Elizabethan world 
is a much more magical world than our own right i'm saying that and then i'm i'm surrounded with people who do magic you know every day and hashtag witches of instagram and magic is coming back into our world rightfully so people are starting to reappropriate concepts of magic which is really just you know nature in the universe the elizabethans believed in a lot of things that we don't believe in anymore (laughs) <laughs> that we believe in slightly differently, let's say. One particular strand of Elizabethan thinking that I adore is astrology and astronomy. So, you know, a lot of people confuse astrology and astronomy. Astronomy is the science of the stars in the universe. Astrology is your star sign, your moon sign, and the fact that on Tuesday you shouldn't go out unless you're carrying an umbrella if you're a Scorpio. For the Elizabethans, those two things were actually the same science. The queen had an official astrologer that served the purpose of advising her on what to do based on the star's position in the sky. Should I go to war with Ireland? Not this year, your majesty, because there was a comet and it's not a good sign, right? And the queen would actually do what he said. Because if the stars are not literally aligned, you shouldn't act on certain things. Shakespeare talks a lot about the spheres and the music of the spheres and the beauty of the spheres and all of that. And for the Elizabethan, that was very much part of the world. I think for one, because they could actually see the stars. I don't know about you, but I haven't seen the stars in a long time. And when I can do it, I just kind of bathe (laughs) in in stargazing and I just like stand there for hours until somebody just pulls me back inside or back into the city or something but we we don't have that relationship anymore because our world is too full of electrical light so stars is a big part of it and then the magic of the woods right the very natural world that has a lot to do with where Shakespeare came from. I was never one to underestimate the power of dreams. Ooh, by Jove's earlobes, that's a good one. Dreams, dreams, yes, write it down, write it down. Dreams, wonderful. Uh, Dreams, uh, you know, when, when you're lacking inspiration, dreams are often a very good place to start. I've actually met some of my favorite characters in dreams. Um, uh, who here knows Mercutio from Romeo and Juliet? Oh. Then I see Queen Mab have been with you. <laughs> she is the fairy's midwife, and she comes in shape no bigger than agate stone on the forefinger of an alderman drawn with a team of little atomies over men's noses as they lie asleep. Her chariot is an empty hazelnut made by the joiner squirrel or old grub. Time out of mind, the fairy's coach makers. Her whip of cricket's bone, her lash of film, and in this state she gallops night by night through lovers' brains, and then... They dream of love. <laughs> oh, courtiers' knees who dream on curtsies straight. Oh, lawyers' fingers who dream on straight dream on fees. Oh, ladies' lips who straight on kisses dream. Which oft the angry mab with blisters plagues because their breaths with sweetmeats tainted are. Sometime driveth she over a soldier's neck and then dreams he of cutting foreign throats, breeches, ambuscadas, Spanish blades, drums in his ears at which he starts and wakes and thus being frightened, swears a prayer or two and sleeps again. This is the very mab that plets the manes of horses in the night, that bakes the elf rocks in foul, sluttish hairs. This is the hag when maids lie on their back that presses them, learning them first to bear, making them women of good carriage. This is she. Peace, peace. Mercutio, peace. Oh, talks of nothing. True. I talk of dreams, which are the children of an idle brain, begot of nothing but vain fantasy, which is as thin of substance as the air, and more inconstant than the wind. The wind. (laughs) Oh, what are stories, if not dreams, carried on the wind? Stratford-upon-Avon is this idyllic little town nestled in between the banks of the River Avon and there's lots of beautiful 
plants and, you know, vegetation and fields and little woods. And in As You Like It, Shakespeare sets the story in the Forest of Arden. His mother's name was Mary Arden and she lived on a farm and it's all, it's all linked. One of the other things that is very strong is that because of all of these allusions to the natural world, a lot of Shakespeare's reference to the natural world is to plants, flora, fauna, types of things you can use to shear sheep that are all native to Warwickshire. So a lot of the things he talks about are things only someone who grew up in Warwickshire could know. The plants he references, the flowers' names. And, you know, and there's loads of studies and there's loads of wonderful people who do wonderful work and excavate a lot of what Shakespeare's references actually allude to. And um, the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust does wonderful work in the gardens of all of their properties to have beautiful vegetation that could have been found in Warwickshire at the time. So go have a walk around and you'll see exactly what I mean. That's where we should look next, yes. A bit of nature, a bit of magic. Midsummer Night's Dream. Yes, of course. Over him, o'er dale, thar a bush, thar a briar, o'er park, o'er pale, thar a flood, thar a fire. I do wander everywhere, swifter than the moon's sphere. And I serve our fairy queen to dew her orbs upon the green. The cowslips tall, her pensioners be. In their gold coat spots, you see, at those be rubies, fairy favours. In their freckles live their savours. I must go seek some dewdrops here, and hang a pearl in every cow slips ear. Farewell, thou lob of spirits. I'll be gone. Our queen and all her elves come here anon. Oh, magic's fantastic, isn't it? Oh, I, I, I just love that we can believe in magic. Fairies, especially the ones in Midsummer Night's Dream, just, you know, come from the wood. They appear in the wood. They're magical creatures from the wood. In Romeo and Juliet, Mercutio has a whole speech about Queen Mab. Oh, I see Queen Mab hath been with you. She's the fairy's midwife. And that's definitely, you know, a child's bedtime story from Warwickshire. It's something that you can easily imagine, like his mother passing on to him through the generations and something that an old wife's tale, you know, that could be told around the fire. And then all the fairies. And then there's the witches. Now, witches are another deal entirely because what happened with witches is that King James I, the new king, so in Shakespeare's lifetime, there were two sovereigns, Queen Elizabeth I. And then when Queen Elizabeth died without a child because she had never married, King James I, previously King James of Scotland, came down into England and became King James of England. And he was a big fan of witches. He believed in witches. He wrote a whole treaty about witches and about how to find them and discover them and all of that. It was actually called A Discovery of Witches. You know what? I'll tell you a bit of a secret, okay? Lighten the mood. Um, King James has commissioned me to write a play. <laughs> His Scottish play. <laughs> and... Um, He's obsessed with witchcraft and witches. Now, I'm a normal person, like you guys. I'm absolutely terrified of witches, but he wants me to write it for this play, so I decided to put the witches in, and I've tried to make them as mysterious and weird and disgusting as possible. After all, witches be witches. So, here we go, here we go. I'll give you a taster. It's, uh, it's a bit of a rough draft, but we'll see. We'll see what the character's like. Here we go, here we go. Um, when shall we three meet again? In thunder, lightning, or in rain? Run the hall of battles down. <laughs> Run the battles lost and won. That shall be air the set of sun. Here we go, here we go. Where the place? Upon the hall. <laughs> there to meet with Macbeth. <laughs> I can green Malkin, Roderick calls, and I. Foul's foul and foul's far. 
Arthur through the fog and filth alive. <laughs> when Shakespeare wrote Macbeth or the Scottish play, he said it in Scotland. The guy who in- eventually inherits the throne, Banquo's son, is from the line of King James. So we know that King James I is descended from Banquo and there's witches. Right. So it's an absolute crowd pleaser. Shakespeare's just writing to please his audience. He's like, you like that? Great. I'll put loads of that in play. Now, there's also some interesting magic in The Winter's Tale. When at the end of The Winter's Tale, a woman who has been turned into a statue for 14 years magically awakes. And the beauty of the ending of The Winter's Tale is that we don't know. Is this really supposed to be actual magic and she was a statue and then she awakes? All right, fine. Or did they punish the very jealous king for ruining his relationship with his wife, his children and his entire kingdom by pretending that she was a statue? One of the things that is often said when performing Shakespeare or directing Shakespeare is say everything truthfully. Shakespeare means what he says and he says what he means, right? As an actor, you have to hang on to that. The only thing we have is the words. We have no stage directions except one exit pursued by a bear. That's it. That's the one we have. I mean, you know, (laughs) doesn't really tell you how to play it. Just tells you what's going on. But that's about it. You know, we have a few entrances, few exits, and that's about it. So the only thing we can hang on to is the words the characters say. And in Shakespeare's plays where magic exists, the characters actually believe in it. You know, they take it at face value and go, yep, you know, this magical thing is happening. Great. Roll with it. Now, our contemporary sensibilities are different. And often we go, yes, but what does it really mean? Hmm, three witches, what do they represent? And we make up these other things, you know, fairies. Oh, we're so shy of fairies. <laughs> this is why we let kids do Midsummer Night's Dream, because everyone's like, mm, but the fairies must be evil, or the fairies must be in his head and it's the whole LSD trip. So we, we often try to take the magic away from Shakespeare. Because I think we're quite uncomfortable with it. There's a sense of the fact that it should stay in childhood. Magic is a very infantile thing in our society. And the adult people who, you know, believe in magic get dubbed to be quite silly and childish, childlike. And that's apparently a bad thing. In our productive world, that's a bad thing. It's something that I think we need. There's a reason why, you know, for the last 20 years, the fantasy genre has made a comeback since The Lord of the Rings became a movie in 2001. Because we need it. We love it. For some reason, the English countryside is just very, it's just a great starting point for magic. The most well-known and well-loved fairy tales and magical books in the world have been written by people who lived in the English countryside. (laughs) So maybe there is something with the plants and the fairies and something that's speaking to the English psyche on a level that is magical. Richard Burbage and I were travelling on a dirt road at dusk. We were going to Inverness, but we seemed to have lost our way. And that is when she appeared. Ooh. Well, I mean, you say that, but she didn't really appear, appear. I mean, there must have been an explanation for it. And, yeah, now that I think about it, I think she just emerged from some shrubbery. <laughs> anyway, yes, if, we hadn't, if she hadn't spoken first, we would have missed her. Yeah. And how did I know she was a witch, you ask? Well... She was singing a song. And she was gathering sage, which is... Love sage. She disappeared into thin air. Well, at least I think she did. There was a lot of mist. But I mean, obviously she was a fake witch. There's no way in hell that I'd be more famous than Richard Burbage, like ever. (laughs) The great thing about magical characters is that 
they're immediately proposed at the top of the food chain. So both the witches and the fairies, Oberon and Titania, are above the mortal kings. Shakespeare's world is a very hierarchical world where the queen is virtually god on earth. So the magical characters, when they arrive in these plays, magical beings become automatically above the human hierarchy. And that's fun, right? Because they get to come in and crash the party and disturb the natural order of things. And they get to play with people's minds. They get to play with things that otherwise wouldn't change. So in Midsummer Night's Dream, when they make everybody fall in love with the wrong person, is something that would be incontrollable otherwise. They represent these very primal forces that drive the action in a way that is chaotic and juicy and fun. And I think Shakespeare, because he loves the Greek myths, the Greek mythology, the Roman mythology, where their gods are very powerful and their gods play with human lives and emotions much more freely than the traditional Judeo-Christian god does, right? God doesn't really interfere in human affairs. Whereas the Greeks and the Romans, gods are on earth all the time, just causing chaos and playing with people's feelings and creating horrible situations and just in general, you know, having a grand old time. So Shakespeare's magic, I feel, is quite pagan in that sense of faithful to the old traditions, faithful to the fairy tales, and very disruptive. So I'm looking for Titania's monologue in A Midsummer Night's Dream. As every book of Shakespeare's complete works, this is a, an enormous book. All right. King John, going back in time. A Midsummer Night's Dream. All right. This is her talking about her and her husband, Oberon, the king of the fairies, having a massive row. And because of their row, the natural world is descending into chaos. And this is an incredible speech, I feel, for the world today. Because of our disregard for nature's cyclical natural rhythm and order, and our blatant lack of respect, frankly, for Mother Earth, we have disrupted things and we have, we're now reaping what we sowed. And already in Shakespeare's time, you can tell that living in harmony with nature is something that was very, very present in their mind. This is the kind of the tiptoeing beginnings of what would become industrialization and, and industry. I'm just going to read it. These are the four days of jealousy. And never since the middle summer spring met we on hill, in dale, forest, or mead, by paved fountain, or by rushy brook, or in the beached margins of the sea to dance our ringlets to the whistling wind. But with thy brawls thou hast disturbed our spot. Oh, can you hear that? She's like, see, she's spitting in his face. I love it. But with thy brawls thou hast disturbed our spot. Try saying that without spitting in someone's face. It's really hard. Therefore the winds, piping to us in vain, as in revenge have sucked up from the sea, contagious fogs which, falling in the land, have every pelting river made so proud that they have overborne their continents. The ox had therefore stretched his yoke in vain. The ploughman lost his sweat, and a green corn hath rotted, ere his youth attained a beard. The fold stands empty in the drowned field, and crows are fatted with the murray and flock. The nine men's morris is filled up with mud, and the quaint mazes in the wanton green for lack of tread are undistinguishable. The human mortals want their winter cheer. No night is now with him nor carol blessed. Therefore the moon, the governess of floods, pale in her anger, washes all the air that rheumatic diseases do abound. And thorough is this temperature we see the seasons alter. 
hoary-headed frosts fall in a fresh lap of the crimson rose, and on old Hyam's thin and icy crown an odorous chaplet of sweet summer buds is as in mockery set the spring, the summer, the childing autumn, angry winter, change their wanted liveries, and the mazed world by their increase now knows not which is which. And the same progeny of evils comes from our debate, from our dissension. We are their parents and original. Oh, isn't that beautiful? The same progeny of evils comes from our dissension. Hi, my name is Jonathan Blakely and I am an actor and a writer based in London, in the UK. Mostly work in theatre more than anything else. I've got experience, you know, in the West End and UK tours, as well as taking my own play up to Ed Fringe in 2018, um, before having a small run at Theatre 503 in London. And I think my favourite moment of the Bard in the Yard project as a whole was when I got to do it in my own back garden in Stratford for the head theatre critic of the Daily Telegraph. Um, It was just very bizarre having that person in my back garden watching me do a solo show whilst he had an Aperol spritz in his hand (laughs) that my friend had made for him. And, you know, it, it was also a really amazing moment for me because, in a way, it was the first ever performance in London since the pandemic had begun back in March 2020. So to be a part of that, you know, and to be a part of that with the Bard in the Yard project is really quite an honouring moment for myself. And yeah, really proud. Look back on that with a lot of pride and it was really well written uh, afterwards by, by Dominic Cavendish. So yeah, that for me is a big, big one. And I know that there's so much more to come with the project as a whole. Thank you to Alex Dunmore, Constanza Roof, Hannah Young, Henry Sharnock, Honey Gabriel, Jonathan Blakely, Jonathan McGarity, Keith McGuire, Will Harrison Wallace, Charlie McKellar, and all the other bards. King Leonardo is being performed by Rupert Sadler. The Scottish play is being performed by Luke Ferruccia. This podcast is produced by Will & Co. and La Souris Verte and supported by the Swiss Cultural Fund UK. My name is Zelda Chauvet. This is Shakespeare Goes Viral. Shakespeare Goes Viral